Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Thursday, January 19th edition of the Basement Academy. Let me invite you to listen, watch all the way through. That, that may be your practice and habit anyway, but I suspect some maybe click off after a few minutes if it doesn't, you know, kind of catch your interest. But I think today's reflection uh, is important. Um, I think they're all important, but, but, but certainly today, as we continue our reflection on the essential tenets in this uh, core tenet belief about the authority of God's Word. But let me begin with a psalm, Psalm 19, and listen for how God's Word is spoken of and honored and, and revered by the psalmist. I love, love, love this psalm. <clears throat> psalm 19, for the director of music, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then will I be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. God speaks through creation. The heavens declare the glory of God, the sun rising and running through throughout the, the, the sky. <clears throat> and so creation speaks but God's word speaks. <laughs> the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Mm, the commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. <clears throat> and so as we <clears throat> come back to this first essential tenet that gives such a firm foundation for our faith, <clears throat> our faith is grounded in the authority of God's word. So God's word is the authority authority for our confession. What it is we say we believe as Christians, we are not afraid to say where our authority comes from. And it does not come from ourselves, right? <clears throat> and so we have to remember something. It's been a while since I've been in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, I think, right? Or certainly Genesis 3. Do you remember how how the, the, the serpent tried to get at Eve and got at her. So chapter 3, verse 1, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Now, we don't know that God said that, but because that's not in the original uh, prohibition. Now listen to the serpent. Verse 4, You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. 
For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. We have to understand what the tempt we have to understand the temptation for what it is. It's not God wants you to be healthy and so don't eat that fruit. Go eat these fruits. That's going to put weight on you and it, it, it's not the eating of the apple. It, it's something deeper. It's much more insidious. It, it, it is it is much more insidious. What the serpent is doing is questioning the authority of God and God's word. He is undermining. He's introducing doubt. Did God really say that? Are you now are you sure that's what he said? Well, uh, yeah, he said you we we may eat of the trees of the garden, but of the, the tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we may not eat and may not touch it. Now, we don't know that God said that. That's not revealed to us in the word. So did all of a sudden Eve, we can't even touch that thing. You surely will not die. Now God said to Adam, if you eat of that fruit, the day you do that, you're going to die. There are going to be severe consequences. And the serpent directly contradicts the word of God. And so the authority of God is questioned um, the, the, I think the character of God is actually being questioned. God knows that when you, when you eat of that, your eyes are going to be open and you're going to be like God. Well, they're already like God. They're made in the image of God. They're, they're, they're just how God wants them to be. He, bearing their, his image with these capacities, capacity for relationship and love and work and service and bringing forth uh, t the creative capacities to bring forth new life, be fruitful and multiply. They were just like God, the way God wanted them to be. But he goes further, he says, you're going to be like God, knowing good and evil. And so the original sin is not eating an apple, not eating a forbidden fruit that that is too simplistic and that that deflects away from the heart of what the sin really is it is rejecting the authority of god and god's word in one's life and so what happens when they lay hold of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil i've said this many times um, the, the core of what's going on there is a usurping of authority. God is the one. God is the author of life. He has the first word in the beginning, God, right? God speaks the world into being. Let there be light. Let there be land. Let there be people, right? God speaks the world into being. And so God's word is creative. It is powerful. It is generative. God has the first word. God has the last word, right? God is the author of this story. Therefore, God is the one who determines right and wrong, good and evil. So what happens in the eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what the serpent tempts them towards, because they have, they're created as moral agents. They have a conscience. They, they can sense a right and a wrong, right? So there's this reality. But what happens there? is to know good and evil when they take of that free. What they're doing is they're usurping the authority of God. God is no longer the authority. God no longer has the first word and the last word on life. God no longer has the first word and last word on good and evil. That becomes, it's usurped. They, they take to themselves the authority to determine right and wrong, good and evil for themselves. They, in a sense, in, in the truest kind of meaning of that word become autonomous. Auto is, is the prefix for self. Nomos is the word for law. They become a law unto themselves. And so Adam determines right and wrong, good and evil for himself. Eve determines right and wrong, good and evil for herself. Well, what happens when they don't agree? Well, then you get a, a little battle of wills there, don't you? Uh, any married couple knows what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> Anyone who's got children knows what I'm talking about. Anyone who works anywhere. <laughs> if you're alive as a human, you know this battle of wills. And so 
the curse is that we are consigned to thinking we're always right. And if there's ever a point where I change my mind, then I'm going to change my mind. I'm no longer going to think this is the right thing to do. I'm going to think this is the right thing to do, and I'm going to double down on it. Now, that's not all bad, right? God made us for moral agency. He made us to rejoice in the right and to reject the wrong. But what happens in the temptation, the original sin, is... It was right to obey God. It was right to listen to God. And they rejected that. They rejected the authority of God and became an authority unto themselves. So I now think I have the first word and last word on good and evil. You think you have the last, first and last word on good and evil. We, as humans, this is what it is. We think we know better than God. How could God allow all this suffering in the world? The God I believe in would never allow that to happen. And who died and put you in charge of judging God and what's right and wrong for God to do? We don't even, we don't even recognize that we're doing it. It's so ingrained in us. It is so a part of our nature. That's what the scripture calls our sinful nature. At the heart of this thing that we inherit <laughs> from our families, our, our, our father Adam, as it were, down through the human family, this intrinsic confidence and assurance that I'm right. I'm right to judge my neighbor. I'm right to judge God. I'm right to judge myself. And so when we turn on ourselves and we think we're worthless and we're no good, that is not correct. That is not right. You are valued. You are loved. You are an image bearer of the glorious God. And so we become overconfident in our ability to assess the world. And so we routinely judge our neighbor. We routinely judge our, our, our family members and spouses and children and co-workers. And, and we judge God. And so... This is what was going on in the garden. It was an issue of authority. God's word, God was accurate. He was true. He was right. Because when they ate that tree, boom, their relationship died. Their relationship with God, pff, there, there was this, this great gulf. There's only one God. There's only room for one person on that throne, and that's God, right? And kind of enthroning themselves and so their relationship, and then it, it passes on to their children. Cain rises up against their other son, Abel. We read that in chapter 4. Am I my brother's keeper? I feel completely justified in killing my brother. I have no responsibility for him. Absolutely, you are your brother's keeper. And so the, 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 the original sin, the temptation, is an attack on the authority of God and God's word. And that's the story of the human family, right? And so the redemptive story, the salvation story, is a story of restoring the centrality of the word of God. So Jesus becomes the living word of God. And Jesus demonstrates the way out of this thing is to believe in him, the word of God, and watch how it works. We surrender we submit, we yield. He yielded to sinful humans. He yielded to Judas. He yielded to uh, the Roman guards. He yielded to Pilate. He, he surrendered to a death on the cross to demonstrate that the only way out of this thing where you guys think you're in charge, you have got to lay down your life. You are not in charge. You don't know good. Your authority, you are not the authority uh, on this uh, in this game, in this story. And so there's this phrase. Let me read from our essential tenets document. <clears throat> this is at the bottom of that first page. We confess that God alone is Lord of the conscience. God alone is Lord of the conscience. I am not the Lord of my own conscience. See, that's the key. I am not the Lord of my conscience. My conscience Again, historic Christian faith, okay? Now, the world says otherwise, and progressive Christian faith says otherwise. Historic Christian faith says God alone is Lord of the conscience. I have to answer to God at the end of the day. So uh, my conscience says this is right and this is wrong. Well, I may think that's right and wrong, but ultimately, 
God is going to judge uh, my conscientious uh, actions and words. We confess that God alone is Lord of the conscience, but this freedom is for the purpose of allowing us to be subject always and primarily to God's Word. The Spirit of God will never prompt our conscience to conclusions that are at odds with the Scriptures that He has inspired. The Spirit will never prompt us to a conclusion that is contrary to the revealed Word of God. And so, to take an example of this, in our day, in our society, and it's come into our denomination. Did God really say that in the beginning he made them male and female? Surely God did not make them male and female. We ha- you have authority over male and female. You have authority to determine whether you are male, male or female. That's the spirit. It's it's the exact same temptation that is now playing out. It is cutting to the core of what it means even to be human. And so our society says, absolutely, you can determine your gender, your sex, your anything about you. You you don't even have to be one of those. You could be non-binary. You don't there is no binary. And so our denomination is rejecting that there is a binary of male and female in direct contradiction to the word of God. (laughs) He made them male and female in the image of God. He made them and he said, be fruitful and multiply. So men don't have babies. Now our world says so, but this is an expression. And so in our own denomination in the Presbyterian church, and this is where the alignment challenge comes. People claim, well, my conscience, my conscience says that I can believe that. Okay, but that's a, a, a way. It's it's a way of maintaining autonomy. I believe it's right and wrong, and so, and that's the th- so we have to submit. The challenge of the human family is humility. Pride is the chief sin, right? Pride is which asserts my will be done, my desires, my conscience, my uh, opinion, my view of good and evil, my view of what's right and wrong is what's most important. Historic Christian faith says no. You are responsible to seek and discern what is good and evil, but you do so in submission to the word of God. And at the end of the day, God alone is Lord of the conscience. We are not Lord of our own conscience. We are Lord of nothing, (laughs) right? We are servants. So the challenge is humility and then ultimately submission to the word. And so that's the tension that's going on in our society. It's a battle of wills. And so a doctor may have a conscientious concern. A Christian doctor may not wish to perform gender-affirming surgery on on a person, and they may lose their license. And so the world is has gone after this um, rejection of authority. And it's nothing new, of course, right? So that's just an example, but it's a a very uh, relevant example of how this whole thing, why we, this is an essential tenet, the authority of the word of God, not the authority of the human conscience, not the authority of the Presbyterian book of order, the authority of the Word of God. Now, I may not like some things, you know, because sin makes me want to do my own thing. Sin makes me to want to double down and think I'm right and God's wrong. But hey, you know what? At the end of the day, I want to be on God's side, right? And so we're going to talk tomorrow to finish out this week about the challenge of interpretation, right? Well, who's to say whose interpretation is right, okay? And that's typically how this game plays out, right? And so the game plays uh, over interpretive battles. So anyway, hope you watch to the end. Hopefully it gave you something to think about. Might get your blood boiling maybe at me. You might be upset at me from some of the things I've just said. Or your your blood might be boiling because you agree with what I say and you look at our society and our denomination and others and think this is wrong. And so that's why this is such a challenge, okay? So in humility, (laughs) let's listen to the word of God. Let's pray for ourselves uh, and, and for others and let's seek to love our neighbor as best we can today. Let's pray. 
And so, Father, thank you <clears throat> that we are not the lords of our own consciences. And when we seek to assert that in our own autonomy, we only make a mess of things as Adam and Eve did. And so we pray your mercy. <clears throat> we pray your spirit of repentance and penitence to be in our lives and where we find ourselves wanting to assert ourselves uh, over others on issues and, and to become angry with others. Lord, we pray that you might move in our hearts. Give us such a spirit as Jesus had, even from the cross, as he was laying down his life, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And so teach us the way of Jesus. Teach us the way of humility. Teach us the way of submission. Teach us the way of honoring and embracing and loving your authority in our lives. And so hear us as we make our prayer. In the name of Jesus, our great high priest and living word, as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May God give you such a heart to recognize and love and delight in his authority and his lordship and his kingdom. Would you seek first his kingdom today and every day? Amen and amen.